I'll never leave you or forsake you For you're my dear and precious child Why are you sad? Why do you worry? I'm always with you by your side It doesn't matter if the world should fall apart I promised to be with you through the thick and thin Remember who I am and what I've done for you I sacrificed my son to bring you home to me So trust in me I'll never leave you or forsake you For you're my dear and precious child Now don't you worry about the future I'm gonna bring you safely home Why do you act as though I didn't care at all? Why do you live in fear of what might lie ahead? Don't be afraid, my child, I'm watching over you Be strong and be courageous, I've got a plan for you So trust in me, trust in me, trust in me, trust in me, yeah Oh, my love is unconditional Oh, so rest assured, be comforted I will complete my work in you So rejoice Oh rejoice Oh rejoice Oh rejoice Yeah, because I'll never leave you or forsake you That's right For you're my dear and precious child No matter what the world might tell you I'll be together forever Forever, I am the one who made the heavens and the earth Who gave you life and help in your time of need Am I not strong enough or compassionate Or have you now forgot who and what I am So trust in me, trust in me, trust in me I'll never leave you or forsake you I'll never leave you or forsake you I'll never leave you or forsake you All right Trouble with the uh, pal talk? Oh, good. Good. He was, he was pretty sable. The other, hey, Shane, can you take this? Sorry to make you move. Thank you. All right. All right, could you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 4? And let's start uh, where I want to have you start. Look at Daniel chapter 4. And look at verse 34. Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. Uh, also, you should have my translation of chapter 4 open as well at that verse. Daniel 4, 34. So, if you could turn there. And uh, we have a couple announcements. Very important announcements. Some not as important. Actually, pretty much all of them are important, I suppose. Uh, first of all, um, if you could keep in prayer, uh, Carol Ann's uh, grandmother. Uh, she's not doing well, so keep her and Carol Ann in prayer and the family. And also, of course, we want to keep in prayer the people on the East Coast who've got, uh, it's like, especially New Jersey and New York, they got hammered. A lot of these people, their homes got washed away, and there were fires and everything because the transformers blowing. So we want to keep them in prayer. And also, uh, remember, we have next, uh, on November 8th, um, on Thursday, November 8th, we won't have class. And also, remember, Tuesday, November 20th, and Wednesday, November 21st, and Thanksgiving, Thursday, November 22nd. We will have no classes, so on those four cla days. Uh, also, we have a, 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 um, a very a, a notary, a notary uh, what do they call it, the person? Uh, uh, no, it's around that area. Uh, what's, um, 
a very famous person right in our midst right now. I shouldn't say he's famous, but he's uh, famous in Marion School System right now. It's uh, Tyler Thompson, and uh, you know, just want to give my uh, congratulate him publicly before the whole world. Uh, Tyler he got a 4.0 um, grade point average uh, this quarter, so he's uh, he's a lot richer. <laughs> And his father's a lot poorer, but he's, uh, I'm very proud of him. And of course, his, family, his dad's really proud of him, Jody, and his sister is too, I'm sure. No, she's shaking her head now. Cheyenne's she, very smart herself. And, uh, but uh, Tyler, he had a good, uh, he, had a, he had great grades, a straight A. So my congratulations to you, my friend. Not only are you the smartest kid I know, teenager I know, but also, believe it or not, but also it's very, um, it's even more impressive that you, you listen to the word of God and that's, uh, that's impressive as well, of course. So congratulations to you guys, and congratulations to Tyson and Jody. You got a uh, smart kid in your hands, so hopefully he keeps it up. We'll have to keep him in prayer, along with Cheyenne, of course. And I think that's about it. Let's take a moment of silent prayer and uh, prepare, to uh, prepare ourselves. Uh, this is a time where we examine ourselves, a very important time, because uh, we want to be in fellowship with God and be able to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to through the teaching of the Word of God. Otherwise... Uh, being a Bible class, you could be sitting in the seats, and if you're out of fellowship, you're not going to get too much out of it. So uh, uh, the Holy Spirit is there to help us as our true teacher and mentor. He indwells us, specifically he indwells our soul. And so what he does is, as our true teacher and mentor, he helps us to understand the Word of God. He convicts us of sin. He un- helps us to understand the teaching of the Word of God. He guides us in the application of the Word of God because he's inspired the Scriptures. And Jesus talked about this ministry with the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. He talked about that in relation to the unbeliever in John 16, uh, verses 5 through 15, and also in chapter 16 of the Gospel of John, verses 13 through 15, he talked about the Holy Spirit would come and make uh, his teaching uh, understandable to to the apostles, and uh, so that's what he does for us right now. Paul talked about something like that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So uh, in order to uh, to understand what the Spirit's saying to us this evening, we need to be in fellowship that... uh, involves, first of all, examining ourselves. That's why we take a a moment of silent prayer, examine ourselves, and uh, to see if we need to confess any sin to the Father, doing what 1 John 1, 9 states. If we confess our sins to the Father, He, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins with the result that He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. So uh, if, uh, and and then to stay in in fellowship, you need to uh, bring your thoughts into obedience to the Spirit, and that's when you're being filled with the Spirit, which is commanded to us in Ephesians 5, 18. So with, uh, if there's anything that's bothering you, you can apply Philippians 4, 6, and 7, or 1 Peter 5, 7. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for another day that you've uh, brought us to through. And we just thank you, Father, for gracing us out, treating us in a manner that we don't deserve, giving us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because we're in union with your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the logistical grace, logistical grace blessings that we receive every day uh, that which sustains our, our human our bodies here on this earth. We thank you for the food, the shelter, the clothing, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, uh, we thank you for the salaries that we have, the health that we do have. We thank you, Father, for uh, treat, treating us in that, under your grace policy, Father. We just thank you so much and help us to respond in obedience to you to this grace policy. We thank you for caring for our every need and help us to walk moment by moment and trusting in you to take care of our, our daily needs. So, Father, we, uh, we thank you, Father, for 
this study in the book of Daniel and we thank you for the things that we learn, we're learning and also in Exodus we pray that you would continue to guide us and direct us in this study and we pray that it would bring glory to you in these studies these, the teaching in these studies and also would minister to the body of Christ Father we, we lift up our country at this time we pray that you would give our president and the military and political leaders the wisdom and the moral courage to lead this country uh, we also thank you for them we pray Father for uh, those involved uh, in the, uh, the public domain, doctors, nurses, firefighters, police officers, uh, emergency uh, people, uh, technicians, and uh, we thank you, Father, for them and their service. And we, at this particular time, lift up the people on the East Coast and, and uh, that have been hit by this uh, hurricane and a combination of storms. So we, we just thank you, uh, pray, Father, for them. We pray that this situation, that you would use this situation to evangelize the unsaved, that they would see their need through this uh, adversity. But also we pray that you would uh, also, if there are believers involved in these uh, areas that, that, that are been affected by the storm, we pray that those who are in apostasy or going in the wrong direction as believers, that you, they would hear your voice in the storm and would uh, repent and get back in fellowship with you and be obedient to you. And for those who are believers that are positive, that you would advance them through this adversity. And uh, we just pray, Father, for the civil uh, leaders in these areas that you would give them wisdom in helping the people. And also, Father, we lift up Carol Ann Fletcher and her grandmother in particular at this time. And we just pray you give the doctors and nurses wisdom treating her grandmother. And uh, we just pr we know that she's a believer. So we just pray, Father, that your will would be done concerning her. And we just pray you would give comfort to Carol Ann as well, Father. Uh, we also pray for a uh, Joanne. Uh, we just pray, Father, for uh, George's sister-in-law, Joanne, and uh, we just pray, Father, for her, that you would give her a complete healing, give the doctors and nurses wisdom treating her, and uh, we just thank you, Father, for the fact that she's doing well at this time as well, Father. And uh, this evening, Father, we thank you for the Thompsons opening up their home to us, and we thank you for, for those that might be viewing this class on Pal Talk or through the website, and we thank you for those here, of course, in the Thompson home. And we just thank you for Titus and Tyler and their work behind with the recordings and behind the computers. We just pray that you give them wisdom in that area. And we just pray this evening that the Holy Spirit would do a mighty work through the audience, help everyone to concentrate and make proper application of what's being taught, help everyone to concentrate as well as myself and give me the grace to uh, deliver to your people uh, everything you want them to hear and that you would be magnified and glorified along with your son. So, Father, we also pray for uh, the technology of things would function properly. And we just uh, pray for these people and things. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. All right, it should be at Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. Uh, if you could uh, turn there, uh, both in, my, in your Bibles and also uh, in, your, uh, in my translation of that chapter. Uh, this evening, we're going to know Daniel 4.36, which records that Nebuchadnezzar's sanity and his kingdom were actually restored to him after he repents which is actually a miracle in itself because uh, in that day, and even true today, a, a, a leader of a nation who is deposed from power for seven years, especially when he has a mental illness like this for seven years, they usually, especially in the ancient world, they were either assassinated or they, they, just, they never got back to power or they were killed somehow. But Nebuchadnezzar, God had, uh, through his sovereignty, had sustained Nebuchadnezzar more than likely as we see in the past through Daniel who was the, uh, the uh, commander of the, of the wise men and commanded great respect in the Babylonian government. And uh, so undoubtedly Daniel was God's instrument to protect Nebuchadnezzar while he was deposed from power, while he suffered this mental disorder of boanthropy. So we saw in, the, in, in, at the, uh, in verses 10 through 17 of the chapter, Nebuchadnezzar recounted the content of the dream for, Dan, uh, for Daniel after none of his wise men could uh, uh, interpret the dream for him. Uh, we saw that Daniel responds in verses 20 through 26 and get, uh, re, uh, c communicates the interpretation of the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. And the dream spoke in symbolic terms of the fact that Nebuchadnezzar, who was a worldwide ruler, would be deposed from power for seven years while suffering the mental uh, disorder, as we saw, of boanthropy, meaning he'd be thinking and acting like a, a cow or a bovine or bull. And uh, then we saw that Daniel, in verse seven, 27, gives the king advice and light of that uh, interpretation. And Daniel basically told him, I want you to, you need to repent 
And he talked about the king's conduct, which we saw uh, was an indication, uh, Daniel's advice was an indication that the king was actually a believer at this particular time. Thus he was suffering divine discipline at the hands of the God of Israel. And then we saw that Nebuchadnezzar did not respond uh, 12 months after Daniel gave him the interpretation of his uh, dream, the vision. Uh, he was uh, on, walking on the battlements of his uh, palace, his royal palace uh, in Babylon, one of them and the city of Babylon, and he was boasting of uh, his great empire and the city of Babylon, which he made into the preeminent city of the world at that time because of his military conquest and all the nations and cities that he had plundered. And uh, he was the richest man in the world at that time as well as the most powerful man of the world. So he was boasting about the city of Babylon when God executed uh, the... Uh, executed the sentence against Nebuchadnezzar and in that very moment he was driven from the society of men and suffered that mental disorder of boanthropy for seven years. And then it says, uh, if you look at Daniel 7.34, it says that at the completion of this period of time, after the seven years, I myself, Nebuchadnezzar, in contrast to before this period, lifted up my eyes toward the heavens when my sanity was restored to me. Next I showered the Most High with worshipful thanksgiving, also I praised as well as honored the imminent eternal one because his governmental dominion is forever. In other words, his kingdom is from generation to generation. Verse 35, Therefore, each and every one of the earth's inhabitants are regarded as absolutely nothing in comparison in the sense that he always does, God does, he always does according to his will among the army residing in the heavens, the elect and non-elect angels, as well as the, among the earth's inhabitants human beings. Indeed, there's absolutely no one who has the ability to restrain his power or who can justifiably say to him, what are you doing? Verse 36, our verse for this evening. At that precise moment, my, my sanity was restored to me so that, so that for the praise of my kingdom, my majesty, yes, my splendor was for my benefit restored to me. Also my counselors, as well as my nobles, were making it their habit of seeking me out. Therefore I was reinstated over my kingdom. I even increased an extraordinary greatness. Now as we're going to see this evening, uh, this verse is talking about the fact that God treated Nebuchadnezzar in grace. Remember, he was deposed from power for seven years because he was rebelling against God and he was uh, actually fighting against God. So here, what does God do after reinstating him and after the king repented? God actually, this verse is telling us, verse 36, that God actually gave him even greater power and greater notoriety, and he got more praise, his kingdom got more praise from men after he was reestablished, reinstated to power. So this is God treating him in grace. We would, from the human perspective, we wouldn't expect God to treat Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar so graciously after he was so uh, rebellious in the past, but this is God's greatest policy. God treats us better than we deserve. In fact, every single one of us in this room, every believer, including the great apostle Paul, every Christian, everyone who's a believer in the Lord from Old Testament, Old Testament dispensations, from Adam all the way through the New Testament and to the last believer that is born in history, uh, human history, and including the elect angels, everybody is treated under grace. Every moral, rational creature that's regenerate, whether they're an elect angel or a human being that's born again and saved, all of us have been treated in a manner better than we deserve. We all deserve the lake of fire. Remember, we're sinners by, sinners by nature and by practice. We have no merit with God. This is the whole teaching of Paul in, in the first three chapters of the book of Romans. Yet God in his grace, he has provided a sacrifice through his son Jesus Christ. And through faith in Jesus Christ, uh, we have eternal life and the forgiveness of our sins. Nebuchadnezzar, he believed in the Lord. This is before Jesus Christ, the, the Son of God, became a human being permanently in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. But of course, we've seen in the past, Jesus Christ is the Yahweh of the Old Testament. He was the one who was in the, bla the blazing fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was the one who was the holy watchman of verses uh, 13 through 17 who was speaking to the king in the dream and announced to the king that he would be deposed from power unless he repents. So he had faith in the Lord, the, and Jesus Christ is the God of Israel. You could also say that, of course, of the Father and the Holy Spirit, all three three members of the Trinity, are God. So, 
uh, we see here that Nebuchadnezzar is treated in grace. So this is a great subject. I love this subject of grace. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar is talking about. God treated him better than he deserved. He was reestablished, reinstated as the king of Babylon. And not only did he get everything back that he had prior to being deposed from power, but he even got more blessings from God. Now it says, if you look at the, and I'm reading from the New American Standard, of Daniel 4.36. Daniel 4.36 from the New American Standard. I'll read off this verse from the New American Standard. And if I need to change, change the translation, I'll go into the original language and, and give my reasonings for changing the translation. Of all the slow while I'm doing this, I'll try to, uh, I'm trying to bring out what the, the original text is saying. And, uh, and then we'll have our translation. And then we'll talk about uh, what this passage is talking about, mainly about God's grace towards Nebuchadnezzar. So, it says in Daniel 4.36 from the New American Standard, At that time, my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom, and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was established in my sovereignty, and surpassing greatness was added to me. Let me give you, my, uh, let me give you some other translations of this particular uh, verse, if I may. Uh, in uh, in the, the Net Bible... They translate Daniel 4.36, At that time, my sanity returned to me. I was restored to the honor of my kingdom, and my splendor returned to me. My ministers and my nobles were seeking me out, and I was reinstated over my kingdom. I became even greater than before. I really like the translation of this verse, uh, because it's, uh, it, it, I agree with it, because w w based upon what uh, I found. Now, the ESV, which is much like the New American Standard, it's a literal tra uh, translation, it's a formal equivalence translation. It says in an ESV of this verse, at, that, at the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me, my counselors and my lords sought me out, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Uh, the NIV, which is a a, a uh, dynamic equivalence. They try to uh, get the sense of the original language. They're not trying to translate the words and the orders that they order that they appear. Uh, so the N NIV uh, translates this verse at the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. So in the net and the New American standard, the phrase at that time, my reason returned to me, that first statement, the phrase at that time is a prepositional phrase. It's composed of the preposition baith, and its object is the third person masculine singular pronominal suffix who, which is translated here correctly as a demonstrative uh, pronoun. And then we have the noun zeman, which is translated here time. Now the word zeman is a little bit different than just time. I don't like that translation. It's not bad. It's not precise from my perspective. The word zeman actually means the precise moment. And it refers, and the reason why that is, is because it's referring in context to a specific point in time when Nebuchadnezzar was restored to power by God. Now, as I said before, it's the object of the preposition baith, which is functioning as a temporal marker, and it's correctly translated here, at. And the reason why is that it's because it's referring to the precise or exact moment when Nebuchadnezzar was restored to power by God. Now, as I said before, the pronominal suffix who is translated here as a demonstrative pronoun that correctly because it refers to the completion of the seven years when Nebuchadnezzar repented. So therefore, uh, if you look at these three words in the, in the original, uh, they literally mean at that exact moment, or we could say at that precise moment, and they answer the, this, this prepositional phrase answers the question, when Nebuchadnezzar was restored to power by God. Thus, this prepositional phrase refers to the completion of the seven years in which Nebuchadnezzar was disciplined by God and then humbled himself before God by lifting up his eyes towards the heavens. So, in other words, this prepositional phrase translated at that time uh, by the, net, uh, the New American Standard and by, by the phrase uh, at that same time in the ESV and at that time by the Net Bible, this prepositional phrase is pointing to the events 
of chap, uh, chapter 4, verse 34. It's referring to verse 34, the events of verse 34. So if you look at verse 34, then at the completion of this period of time, I myself, Nebuchadnezzar, in contrast to before this period, and I'm reading from my translation, by the way, lifted up my eyes toward the heavens when my sanity was restored to me. Next, I showered the Most High with worshipful thanksgiving. Also, I praised as well as honored the imminent eternal one because his governmental dominion is forever. In other words, his kingdom is from generation to generation. So when we look at verse 36 and the phrase at that time, or we could say at that exact uh, precise moment, uh, that's actually, that prepositional phrase is referring to the events recorded in verse 34, which what? They actually record Nebuchadnezzar repenting. He's acknowledging God as sovereign. He's praising God, just like he did in Daniel 3.28 when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were restored to, uh, were delivered from his hand. But the difference is, is Nebuchadnezzar is actually acknowledging that God is sovereign over his life. He trusted in the Lord in chapter 3, verse 28, because he saw the power of, Daniel, uh, of Daniel's God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God. He trusted in him, but he had, like a lot of believers, they believe in the Lord, but yet they still don't, after conversion, they still rebel against God's authority in their life, and that's reflected in their disobedience to him after their conversion. So Nebuchadnezzar, like a lot of uh, believers, needed to be disciplined, and so that he would be more, uh, he'd be more obedient uh, to God. So this prepositional phrase, at that time, it refers to the completion of the seven years in which Nebuchadnezzar was disciplined by God, and then repented by humbling himself before God, when he lifted up his eyes toward the heavens. Now, he then showered, as we saw in verse 34, he showered God with worshipful thanksgiving and also praised as well as honored the imminent eternal one, God, because God's governmental dominion is forever. In other words, as we saw, his kingdom is from generation to generation. Now, when it says, my reason... He says, my, re my reason returned to me. My reason is composed of two words in the original. We have the word manda we've seen in the past, and it's modified by the first person singular, pronominal suffix e, which is, uh, means my here. It's correctly translated. Now, the word manda, we've seen it in the past, it means sanity. And it's used with reference, of course, to Nebuchadnezzar once again thinking rational thoughts and contrast to thinking like a cow or a bull for seven years while under discipline from God. And when it says he, this return, this sanity of his, this ability to rationally think, return to him, that's the uh, verb uh, tube, which we've also seen in the past. It means to return. It's correctly translated. And it's referring, of course, to Nebuchadnezzar's sanity, uh, indicating that it was returned to him by God after seven years of discipline. Remember, he thought like an, acted like an animal for those seven years when he was deposed from power. Then the phrase we have after it, we have the phrase, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. That's a result clause. Uh, it because it presents the result of God restoring Nebuchadnezzar's sanity to them. So if I can point it out, at that, at that time, my sanity returned to me so that, instead of and, my majesty, you could say, so that, because that, those two words, or we could say, therefore, consequently, uh, those words express a, a fact that you're, uh, uh, these, two wor these words like so that, therefore, consequently, express a result clause or ex a result so you could translate this at that time my reason returned to me so that my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom so again that's a result clause the phrase my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my ma my kingdom now you might be saying how do you how do you um, it's a good question because I, uh, I like to bring these things out because guys who are uh, who might uh, think they have the gift to pass the teacher that are uh, viewing this class or listening to it, or there are some pastors that actually check out the classes or download stuff. I like to bring these things out. The, re the way you figure that out, it's very simple. You have to analyze and look at the clauses. You got to look at the, uh, you got to, in this sense, I had to look at the, uh, you have to know the different types of clauses that there are, exegetical clause, explanatory clauses, a sense of clauses. Uh, you need a result clauses, causal clauses. Uh, these are temporal clauses. And so you, what you do is you have to compare the relationship between clauses to determine uh, which the result clause and, and, or, or, or what type of clause it is, whether it's result, temporal, or whatever. So when you look, at, I would compare, at that time my reason returned to me, I compare it with my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. In order to determine the phrase, my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom, I, in order to determine, what, to determine what kind of clause that was, which is a result clause, I had to compare it 
to the previous clause. At that time, my reason returned to me. So that's what you do. You try to analyze it and see if, if, it's, if it makes sense that it's a result clause, and if it's not, you, go, you check something else out. And, but when you have conjunctions, and uh, whether it's Aramaic or in the Greek New Testament, conjunctions are there because they're, they're the hinge words between clauses, and they, they give you an eye, they'll tell you in, uh, what uh, the sentence it's introducing or the clause it's introducing, what it's doing. So that's what I do when I, when I tell you it's a result clause here. It's because I've compared it with the previous clause, and result makes all the sense in the world. And the reason why the New American Standard just translates the conjunction wa is in is that they're leaving this open for the interpreter. A lot of the translations do this with conjunctions like wa. It's easier if they translate it in, and it's not because the translators wouldn't know what... The, you know, didn't know it's a result clause. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But th what they do is they try to leave the translation open for interpretation. Uh, that's why if you look at my translation, uh, I wouldn't translate, the way I translate here uh, for you guys, I should do that because that, tr that translation it reflects my interpretation. I w if I was on a committee to like be on the, on the, to do the New American Standard or the ESV or the NIV, I wouldn't translate this, translate the way I do for you, for them, because I would, they would more than likely want it to be ambiguous to leave it open for interpretation. Because, and, and that's why I to give you my translation, which reflects my interpretation, and you need to hear that because I'm your pastor, and my job is to tell you uh, what the, uh, the text is saying. So when you're dealing with a big audience, and you, you, know, you, 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 you want to have it, a lot of times they'll leave it ambiguous, and it's up to the pastor or the interpreter to tell the congregation, the people, what this, this passage is saying, the details of it. And, uh, and uh, it's very important that you uh, see that and understand why, yeah. When you say leave it ambiguous, you mean it already is ambiguous and they're not adding interpretation. Right, exactly. Right. Right, yeah, T Titus is just asked, uh, it's already, it's, it, they're not trying to make it ambiguous or difficult to understand. They're leaving it, when I say it ambiguous, I'm saying they leave it open for imp, uh, imp interpretation. They leave it very general and generic. That's a better word probably than um, ambiguous, although some, ambiguous is a good word to describe sometimes some of the translations. So uh, it's not always because they're, they're, they don't know what they're doing. They, no, they, they're great scholars that work on these things. It's that they, it, there's, a, there's a, an approach to interpretation. There are different approaches to interpretation. So my approach, um, I think the Net Bible goes closest to being approaching translation the way I do with interpretation. Um, they try to, and I, I personally, see when you have these guys, these are all committees. It's not one person that's doing the, the whole Bible. They have committees, groups of people doing this, which is a good way to do it because you can get away from bias. Because like what if saying one guy's interpretation is off? You know what I'm saying? So it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's a very, diff it's a very um, difficult, translators have a very, very difficult job and it's quite an interesting uh, uh, translation if you're interested, I, you know, it's a, uh, I, I have a whole bunch of stuff on it. So, um, anyways, that's that's why I brought this up about translation, just because uh, the example here that I have in Daniel four thirty six, I give you an example of how I approach to translate this verse. Now, um, then he says, if if you look at it, says for the glory of my kingdom. He says at that time my reason returned to me, my sanity returned to me, so that we can say my majesty and splendor were restored to me. Then he says for the glory. Of my kingdom. For the glory of my kingdom is a prepositional phrase as well. It's composed of the preposition le, and its object is the construct form of the noun yakar, translated the glory of. And this is followed by the, co the construct form of the noun melku, translated kingdom, and it's modified by the first person singular pronominal suffix e, which is translated here correctly my. Now, when you might be saying the construct form of the noun melku, what does construct mean? Construct in the in the Aramaic and Hebrew, it means that this word, Malku, is governing the word that follows it. And they express some kind of genitive relationship. A lot of times it's possession. So it's governing the pronominal suffix e, which is translated my, and that's expressing a, a possession. So they translated it uh, a good here. Now the word yakar uh, that's translated here, the glory of, it means uh, glory, but I like a better word for it is on a better word for it or f words is honor and praise. This word yakar, translated glory, it means glory, but in the sense of honor and praise, and it denotes public recognition, referring to the honor 
the, in the sense of public recognition or praise that Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian kingdom received from men as a result of the king being restored to power by God. Now, this is an ex instance. When you see the word glory, uh, this, is one of the, this is another one of these words that's ambiguous. They leave ambiguous. This time, that's actually a good word to describe this because glory in what sense? And so that's my job is to tell you, okay, it means glory in what sense? A better translation would be something like, uh, you know, uh, 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 my, uh, honor, praise, because this word is speaking about public recognition for Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian kingdom. So he's saying God restored him and his kingdom, but it was, it was for the glory of his kingdom, the praise and honor of his kingdom. So this word, Yekar, if it's translated glory of, it means honor and praise. That's more specific than glory. Glory is kind of glory. What do you mean? And sometimes it, you know, is it used of God's glory? Is it, I mean, then it has a different sense there. Uh, the glory of God or there's the glory of men or the, uh, you know, uh, glorifying God or, you know, it, different, it, the word glory is, is, it has different meanings depending on the context, obviously. So you get to pay attention to these details. So the, the yakar, uh, it actually is the prep object of the preposition let, as I mentioned before. And let is in the, uh, in the Aramaic and the Hebrew, it's, it's the letter lamed. Uh, Hebrew, uh, Aramaic and Hebrew letter Lamed. And so this, ob uh, this Yakar is the object of the preposition Le, and this functions as a marker of purpose. So that's why they translate it for the glory of my kingdom, because the word for, F-O-R, that English word, actually is expressing purpose. Uh, you could translate it explicitly in order to. That, exp that phrase in English expresses purpose, or for the purpose of. Uh, those words and phrases express purpose in the English. That's what the translator is trying to do here by translating it for. They see that there's a purpose involved here. So the, uh, this word yikar is the object of the preposition let, which functions as a marker of purpose, and that means it indicates the purpose of God restoring Nebuchadnezzar's majesty and splendor. Uh, that, uh, the reason for it was so that the inhabitants, the purpose of it was so that the inhabitants of the earth would praise the glory of his Babylonian kingdom. Let me repeat that again. This particular preposition is a marker of purpose indicating that the purpose of God restoring Nebuchadnezzar's majesty and splendor was so that the inhabitants of the earth would praise the glory of his Babylonian kingdom. And the word kingdom, Malku, uh, it, it's correctly translated. It means kingdom and it denotes the sphere of Nebuchadnezzar's authority or control over various nations, ethnicities, and language groups. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, as we've seen in the past, consisted of, of the nations, cities, villages, and farmland he controlled and was given to him by God, as we saw in Daniel 2.37 and 38 and Jeremiah 27. Then it says in verse 36, at that time, my reason returned to me, and he says, my majesty and splendor were restored to me. Now, when he says, uh, my majesty and splendor, uh, my majesty and splendor is composed, first of all, the pronominal suffix, the first person singular, pronominal suffix, e, which is translated here, my, and then it's, we have the, the noun, hadar, which is translated here, majesty, and this is followed, again, by the pronominal suffix, e, translated my, and then we have the conjunction, wa, which is translated here, and, and it's joining the word hadar, majesty, with the word splendor, which is the word ziv. And this word ziv, like hadar, majesty, is modified by the first person singular, pronominal suffix e, translated here correctly, my, as a possessive pronoun. Now, hadar means majesty or greatness is a good translation for the word as well. This indicates that God restored Nebuchadnezzar's sanity to him so that his greatness or majesty was restored to him in the sense that he once again became the preeminent king over all the other kings of the earth. So Nebuchadnezzar is saying here up to this point that God restored his sanity to him so that his Babylonian kingdom could be uh, honored and praised by the men of the earth, but also that his, uh, also God restored Nebuchadnezzar's sanity to him so that Nebuchadnezzar's greatness and majesty was restored to him in the sense that he once again was the preeminent king over all the other kings of the earth. So God's basically restoring him right back to the position that he was before he was deposed from power. Now the word ziv, it's translated here correctly, splendor. And what sense does it, what does it mean, uh, this, my majesty and splendor? Splendor here speaks of, it means splendor in the sense of extraordinarily or transcendently impressive. 
That's what this word means, splendor. It means to be extraordinarily or transcendently impressive. Transcendently means you're above others. That's what this word is saying about Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom. God restored his sanity to him so that his greatness and his splendor, he was extraordinary, he was transcendently and extraordinarily impressive before the men of the earth. So this word, Zeev, splendor, it implies outshining the usual or customary, and it describes Nebuchadnezzar as extraordinarily or transcendently impressive as a king, implying that he outshone the other kings of the earth. So this is God's grace. He, again, he was, he, was, he was not good toward God. His conduct toward God was terrible. He was mistreating the people in his kingdom, the poor in his kingdom, the helpless in his kingdom. And he was deposed from power for seven years, yet you would think when God restored him, to, uh, gave him back his life, you, didn't, you wouldn't expect after his rebellion that God would put him right back in the position that he was before he was uh, disciplined by God. But that's exactly what God did. You would think that God, would, uh, would after he disciplined him, would make him as a pauper or something. At the very best, right? But that's not how God treats any of us, and that's not how God treated Nebuchadnezzar who was a believer at this time, as we saw. Now, the conjunction wa is joining these two nouns, Zeev and Hadar, uh, splendor and majesty. And the word is joining this, the conjunction wa is joining these two words in order to communicate one idea. And that's what we call the figure of Hendiatus. We've seen this figure in all of our, in, in Romans, First uh, Timothy, Daniel, it's all over the Bible, all right? And it's all over every type of language, all, uh, every languages, all the languages. Every language has this figure. Hendiatus, H-E-N-D-I-A-D-Y-S, means that it, the two words are communicating one idea. So this emphasizes, this figure of Hendiatus emphasizes the extraordinary or transcendent impressiveness of Nebuchadnezzar as a king, which distinguished him from the other kings of the earth. Then uh, we have something that's uh, uh, quite interesting here. It's, I say it's a miracle. Uh, this is quite astounding. It says, at that, same, at, the, at, that time, at that time, my reason returned to me so that my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory or for the purpose of the glory of my kingdom, the praise of my kingdom. And then it says, and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. Now, when he says my counselors, we've seen this word in the past. It's the word hadabar. It's correctly translated. And it's referring to those individuals who gave Nebuchadnezzar counsel or advised him with regards to various matters of state. It'd be like the cap president's cabinet in our day and age in America. The word for nobles is the word Reba, uh, Reb, uh, Rab Reban. Rab Reban is translated here correctly, nobles. And this word Rab Reban means nobles referring to the various dignitaries mentioned in Daniel chapter 3. When we saw this word back in Daniel chapter 3. It, therefore, it's, uh, it's talking about the people who attended that dedication these, these different individuals who, who uh, served under Nebuchadnezzar's authority in different places of authority and different nations in his, under his kingdom. So these would include the satraps, the military commanders, the governors, advisors, treasurers, lawyers, judges from the various provinces of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. All these individuals, his counselors, his immediate cabinet, and also the people who would be in the provinces, the provinces, Canada has provinces, the United States has states. America has states, obviously. So all these individuals who are in authority in the various provinces now began to seek him out, whether to, to give him advice or get advice from him. So this is after seven years of being deposed from power and acting like a wild beast. Of course, he was protected, I'm sure, from the public, and, D and Daniel protect him as we, protected him as we saw in the past. Then it says uh, he, they began seeking him out. His counselors and his nobles, the dignitaries, began seeking him out. Began seeking me out is, the, is a prepositional phrase composed of the preposition le. Its object is the first person singular pronominal suffix e, translated me this time. And then we have the verb. We have the pa'el, not the pa'el, but the pa'el, which is the uh, Hebrew equivalent is pa'el. And this is uh, also, it's in the imperfect conjugation. And it's the word be'ah, which is translated here, began seeking. Now this word be'ah means to seek and it indicates that Nebuchadnezzar's counselors and nobles sought to have an audience with the king to discuss matters of state and to seek and give him advice with regards to these matters. So this word saying, they were looking to talk to him now. They wanted to come out and see him. They wanted to discuss things with him. 
Now, this, the stem of this word, which I pointed out, the pa'el, uh, this word is iterative. This uh, stem is iterative, and that simply means that it talks about repeated action or habitual action. So here, this stem, uh, it denotes that Nebuchadnezzar's counselors and nobles made it their habit, once again, to seek out the king for his advice and to give him advice with regards to matters of state. And then we have a couple of uh, statements which close off the verse. It says, uh, So I was reestablished in my sovereignty, and in surpassing greatness was added to me. Now when he says, So I was established in my sovereignty, that's a good translation. It, uh, it, it, that statement, though, it's, it's, it's tra you see the word so? That's reflecting the fact that it's a result clause from the New American Standards perspective. So this statement, I was reestablished in my sovereignty, it's presenting the result of God restoring Nebuchadnezzar's majesty and splendor uh, and uh, in his counselors and nobles, once again seeking him out as a result of God giving him back his sanity. So basically... The result of God giving uh, Nebuchadnezzar back his sanity was that his, his sovereignty, his authority was reestablished. He was now back in charge again. And then we have that last statement, and surpassing greatness was added to me. That's actually an ascensive clause, and the reason why that is is that as it, it, it expresses the shock that God would bless Nebuchadnezzar even more after having to discipline him for seven years, and it denotes that this is out of the ordinary, or not what an unsaved person would expect God to do. However, God, as we believers know, who are positive of the Word of God, know that God is gracious. What does it mean that God's gracious? He treats us all better than we deserve. None of us has any merit with God. We are blessed. We got the great, we're saved, justified through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, of course, after your conversion, God rewards obedience to Him. He rewards those who execute his will as believers and gives them rewards. So uh, we see here, but again, even the rewards are on a grace policy because, you know, quite frankly, you go back to it, we're saved on, on the merits of Jesus Christ, the object of our faith, and his death on the cross. So even the rewards are given to us out of God's grace, meaning we don't earn or deserve that. He, that's how gracious God is. Not only does he save us and give us the forgiveness of our sins and, and identifies us with Christ in his death and resurrection. But he also, in his grace policy, he gives us the opportunity to get rewards. And here we were sinners by nature and practice, disgusting to a holy God, and yet now we have an opportunity to get, uh, not, not, we already have, all believers have, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And on top of that, we can gain rewards if we're faithful and execute God's will for our life as believers. So when he says, and surpassing greatness was added to me, that again is expressing the shock that God would bless Nebuchadnezzar even more after having to discipline Nebuchadnezzar for seven years. And this phrase denotes that this is out of the ordinary or not what an uns unsaved or unregenerate human being would expect God to do. But this is how God acts. See, human beings... Uh, you see it in our world today. Very rarely do you see someone who was, uh, you even see it in churches, unfortunately, today. There are a lot of play, you, you see it a lot of times when someone has failed, all right, you very rarely see somebody restored back to their position before they failed. That's because men don't treat each other in grace. What we do see, though, is God does that. Look at King David. Look at, uh, look at King David. Uh, you can look at a whole slew of people. Peter, you could look at uh, Moses. <laughs> you know, God didn't, uh, you know, Moses did a terrible thing, struck the rock twice, and he didn't, and he was, you know, he's supposed to speak to it. He misrepresented God, and yet God kept him in power as the head of Israel. King David, another guy had committed adultery and murder. Peter denied the Lord three times that he ever knew him. So these are all in, in, these are all in Paul. You know, everybody's treated in grace. All the great believers, all, every believer, the positive, negative, all of us have been treated in grace by God. Now, surpassing greatness tells us that God. This phrase, surpassing greatness, tells us that God went it, it not only restored Nebuchadnezzar to his former state prior to being deposed from power, but gave him blessed them even more. Surpassing greatness is composed of the noun rabu, translated greatness, and surpassing is the word yatir, which we saw earlier. Now, the word rabu means greatness. It's correctly translated. 
But it means greatness in what sense? It means greatness in the sense that Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom had become even more distinguished and eminent throughout the earth or that it stood above all the other kingdoms of the earth than it did before so Nebuchadnezzar, before Nebuchadnezzar was deposed from power. So again, uh, this word rabu means greatness in the sense that Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom had become even more distinguished and eminent throughout the earth so that it stood above all the other kingdoms of the earth than it did before Nebuchadnezzar was deposed from power. So Nebuchadnezzar is saying, I was, my nation, my kingdom was great before I got deposed from power. It became greater when I came back to power. That's amazing. That's a miracle. And nothing like it in the history of the world happened at that point. Up to that point in history, nobody ever saw anything like this where a world ruler and a, a leader of a kingdom actually suffered the, the mental disorder of boanthropy. He was an animal, acting like an animal for seven years. He was away from human society. And then after seven years, he's brought back to power. You would think... You would, you, first of all, you wouldn't expect that to be restored to his former state. You would expect him to be assassinated or become a pauper, at least. But instead, he's reestablished, and he's, he's even bigger and more powerful than he was before the discipline. So this word yatir, translated surpassing, I like the word extraordinary as a translation. And the, and the reason why is because it's describing this greatness of Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom as being extraordinary in the sense that it, this greatness was exceptional or unusual. And now this adjective, yatir, it denotes that this greatness was added to Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom deviated from the norm in the sense that no king or kingdom up to that point in history could be compared to Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom. So this word, yatir, uh, translated surpassing, it means extraordinary. It's telling us that uh, that Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom, it was an extraordinary kingdom. It deviated from the kingdoms of the earth at that time and what had been come before his kingdom. It was unusual, his kingdom. It was, no one could compare to it, no nation, nothing in China, nothing uh, anywhere on the planet could compare to Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon at this point in history after he was restored to power after being deposed for seven years. So this is again, Speaking of God's grace. And then lastly, the phrase, this surpassing greatness was added to me. Was added to me is a verb. We have the word, the haf al, perfect form of the verb, yasaf, translated was added. And then we have the prepositional phrase composed of the preposition la, and its object is the first person singular, pronominal suffix e, translated me. Now, if you notice something, he uses a lot of first person singular pronominal suffix, me, I. This time, though, when he's talking, He's speaking in the context of what God had done for him. It wasn't, look at me. It's now, look what God has done for me. There's a big change in Nebuchadnezzar. Before, it was like Satan. I, 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 me, I, me, my, I, me, my, I, me, my. But now, I, me, my is used in to say, this is what God has done for I, me, my. It's a big change now. God's Nebuchadnezzar, God's on Nebuchadnezzar's mind now. God's got his attention through the discipline and now Nebuchadnezzar is acknowledging that, uh, uh, that God is the one who's done all these things for him. So the word Yasaf, it means to add, to increase, and it refers to God adding extraordinary greatness to Nebuchadnezzar. And it denotes that Nebuchadnezzar increased in extraordinary greatness. So this is an extraordinary miracle, really, that this, this guy who was a worldwide ruler, deposed for power for seven years, acted like an animal for seven years. Now he's back in power and He's even bigger than he was before. This is, the, this is the sovereignty of God, the grace of God in action. Now let me give you my translation of this verse again and then some principles about grace and we'll close. It says in Daniel 4.36, At that precise moment, my sanity was restored to me so that for the praise of my kingdom, my majesty, yes, my splendor, was for my benefit restored to me. Also, my counselors, as well as my nobles, were making it their habit of seeking me out. Therefore, I was reinstated over my kingdom. I even increased in extraordinary greatness. Now, this verse, we have Nebuchadnezzar emphasizing with the reader, you and I, that God treated him in grace or according to his grace policy, meaning that he did not earn or deserve to be restored to power and blessed even more than he was before being deposed from power. Now, remember, who was he writing to? This is a proclamation written to who? The whole world. 
Now, all these people worship foreign gods. Unless they were an Israelite that worshiped Yahweh, they were pretty much, the world was worshiping trees and you know, idols and all kinds of things. So basically, he's, 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 he's evangelizing the whole world by telling the world what God did for him, the God of Israel, who we know is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He's evangelizing the whole world. And what is he talking about? Look what God has done for me. And this is a great lesson for every believer. When we talk about, when we talk about, uh, when we talk to the unsaved, like Nebuchadnezzar is with this proclamation, he's talking to the unsaved in his kingdom, this worldwide kingdom. Learn a lesson from him. We should learn a lesson. He's talking about what God did for me. You know, so when we talk about Christianity, we should talk about what did Jesus do for me? And one of the things that we see in this proclamation is Nebuchadnezzar is rejoicing. He's a happy guy. He's excited. And that is a big, and has a big effect here because that we should learn a lesson. You know, uh, we can make an impact with the unsaved in our periphery by showing our enthusiasm for our God by what virtue of what he's done for us. I mean, of, I mean, of all people who should be rejoicing, it's us. And one of the things that hurts a believer's witness is a lack of joy, lousy, atti lousy attitude, bad attitude, depressed. That doesn't, that's not going to lead anybody to Jesus. What's going to lead people to Jesus is this great mental, dynamic mental attitude, this attitude of joy and happiness. Listen to this. If you go, go back at, when we close, uh, um, read, this, read this chapter and look, and look at it and see the joy in the guy's what the guy's saying. He's a happy guy. We're reading in verse 36. It's jumping off the page. I mean, let me read it to you. At that precise moment, my, my sanity was restored to me so that for the praise of my kingdom, my majesty, yes, my splendor, was for my benefit restored to me. Also, my counselors, as well as my nobles, were making it their habit of seeking me out. Therefore, I reinstated. I was reinstated over my kingdom. I even increased in, in extraordinary greatness. Look at the very beginning of the chapter. In my translation, look what he says. He, he, look at the excitement the guy has. Daniel 4.1, my translation, King Nebuchadnezzar, to each and every person belonging to the nations, ethnicities, and language groups who are living throughout the entire earth, may your prosperity increase. It is, it is pleasing to me. I'm happy to make known to you the miraculous signs, yes, and wondrous signs at that, which the Most High God performed on my behalf. How great are his miraculous signs. Indeed, how great are his wondrous signs. His kingdom is eternal. In other words, his governmental dominion is from generation to generation. Notice the exclamation points, reflecting the fact that he's excited. He's excited. Why is he excited? Look at God did for me. I deserve to be killed. Yet he kept me alive and actually put me back in power and gave me even greater notoriety and impact on the world I lived in. This is a lesson that's first to learn. Look, at, think about what God has done for you. Think about, I think about, one of the things you should do in your prayer, and you pray, when you pray in the morning, when you go to bed, thank him. And you want to know, people say, oh, how long, I mean, I can't even pray, I can't even pray 10 minutes. I can, I can tell you what, I could pray for 10 minutes right now, starting right now, and I could pray for the next 10 minutes and thank God for everything, everything I could think of. And I could go 10 minutes, it will be 15 minutes, that's how long it can go. If you stopped and thought about what God has done for you. See, we always like to look at the glass or the Pepsi can half full. No, half empty. <coughs> oh, jeez, I went down the wrong end. I'm right up my nose there. Gee, I'm not crying out loud. That's what you get for trying to talk and inhale the Pepsi. So anyways, you can't look at the Pepsi can as half empty. As em half empty. It's half full, right? It's all attitude. It's all perspective in life. See, one of the things I notice around, you probably see it in yours. I look at a lot of people like my, 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 uh, my, uh, that I run into during the course of my day, whether I'm going to Hy-Vee, go pick up something, or I go to Starbucks, or I go to, you know, sit there and do some running with my laptop and stuff, and, uh, or I go just to my apartment complex. There's a lot of people not happy, and it's written all over their faces. And I don't know how they feel, because there was a time I was very miserable before I, and, and even when I was a believer early on, I had a hard time with joy. It wasn't until I got more and more into the Word of God that 
I saw a lot of things I should be rejoicing about. And it, t- it, it takes discipline to think about these things. See, what, what, is one of the, what is one of the fruit of the Spirit? Joy. Galatians 5, and 23. The Holy Spirit will produce this joy in us. It's not something you know, you're phony and you try to work it up. It's, it's, it's it, it, the Word of God, will, the Holy Spirit through the Word of God will give you this joy. And if you have a problem with this, ask God to help you. You know, maybe he's gonna, he needs us to, to give us a kick in the boot, a bum or something, or, you know, or maybe a blessing here that we didn't expect. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot of things to thank God for. Just start thinking about the, the things that everything we take granted. Fact, I mean, thank God that you have your, you know, you can walk. You can get out of bed on your own power. A lot of people can't do. Do that. People, you can go to bed, the ba- your bath, you can go to the bathroom by yourself. I mean, some people, they can't do that. They have to have the people help them get to the bathroom. There are people who can't see. They're blind. They can't hear. I mean, Pixie, she can't, she can't hear. I mean, think about that. There's people who can't, who, are, who can't speak, who can't talk. There's people who, who can't think rationally. They have Alzheimer's now. They're, they're, I mean, there are people who are, have dis- all kinds of diseases, cancer. Uh, they're, they're all kinds of people going through, going through different tragedies. I mean, we we got to think about, I mean, look at what God has done for us. I mean, we have our, if we have, our, we have our health, we have a job. A lot of people don't have jobs. I mean, just you have food, shelter, clothing. You have a salary. If you have a job, if you don't have a job, at least you, you know, you can collect or something. I mean, some countries you can't. You're out in the street. You're begging. You know, thank God you live in America. You don't live in some other crazy country like China or something. And then there's the spiritual thing. You're, you're not. You're going to heaven. You're not going to go to the lake of fire. You're going to live with God forever. You ever notice the Bible doesn't say a lot about heaven? It says a lot about the lake of fire, about hell, lake of fire. But it said Jesus talked more about that than he did heaven. Heaven is something, Paul said, eye is not seen, ear is not heard. The things that God has prepared for those who love him. Or has entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. I mean, Paul says there were things in heaven. Remember 2 Corinthians 12? He, he, he couldn't express. He couldn't say anything on earth. It just gonna be, Heaven's going to be that fantastic being in the presence of Christ. That's a great, wonderful thing. We're going to be with him. And that's going to be the most fantastic moment when we're absent from the body, face to face with the Lord. We're going to get a resurrection body. You know what that's going to be like with him? At the rapture? All of a sudden, no more sin nature? I might all of a sudden have hair? Wouldn't that be incredible? Nobody would recognize me here. Where's Pastor Bill? I'm here. And I'll come out here with a big afro, you know, like, you know, hey, Tyler, Cheyenne, Jody. No, I won't have a big afro because God doesn't want a guy with long hair. But I'm telling you right now, I might have, what are you going to do? I'll be thanking, I'll be there, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I have here again. You know, th- think about that. You're going to be, I'm going to get to see my grandmother again. I'm going to get to see, I'm going to see the loved ones who died and went home to be with the Lord. I'm going to be, death can't, d- death can't ruin my day. <laughs> he was believed in me. Even if he dies, he lives. Absent from the body, face to face with the Lord. Forgiveness of my sins. I deserve the lake of fire. No, he's going to forgive me because I have faith in his son, Jesus Christ. I have to do anything. Simple faith. And I can get rewards on top of the resurrection body and my relationship with God rewards if I'm faithful in time. And just look at, just get, you know, I can't tell you, I wouldn't trade it in the world, anything into the world. There are a lot of people who got money, are very wealthy. Um, they have the most beautiful looking wife. They have the most beautiful looking husband. They have kids and they have a white picket fence and a home and all that and they have all those things i got none of those things but let me tell you something i wouldn't trade me i thank god every day that i i my relationship with god and my study in the word of god i wouldn't change study in the word of god in the original languages being able to do this for the full time for the last 11 years is the greatest thing in the world the last 11 years of my life have been the best years of my life even though i'm losing my hair losing my eyesight and uh have a couple nickels once in a while to rub together I'm happy. I, I mean, I'd be a lot more happy if I had a million dollars in my bank account, maybe. Maybe not. Maybe I'd be upset. Maybe I have to give it all to you guys so I won't have the, pro- the problem, the pressure of having a lot of money. But money doesn't give you happiness. Look at Elvis. Look at the Beatles. You know, a lot of these people, wealthy, they don't, that doesn't, that's no, look at Solomon. It's no guarantee you're going to be happy. Money doesn't guarantee happiness. It might take care of some problems or, you know, make life a little bit easier. But it isn't going to give you happiness. The world's filled with people who loaded and are not happy. There are people who are married. Oh, if I only was married. 
That'll make me happy. No, that's a lie. If you're happy now, before you're married, you're going to be happy. And, and your wife is going to, or your husband, the other, your, 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 your loved one is happy before they get married, then you'll have a good marriage. But if you're both unhappy before you get into the marriage, guess what's going to happen? Now you're going to have real misery. Her misery and your misery, boy, that's going to be miserable. Happiness for us comes from our relationship with God. I've been, I, I, I've been down, I've been through the ringer with certain things in my life. I've gone through a lot of different things. And I'll tell you what, I look back and go, how in the world did I go through those things? It, it, one constant I could say was the word of God. It got me through every heartache, broken heart, trouble, adversity, financial problem, health problem, relationship problem, you name it, insecurity, God's word gave me that joy. That was the Holy Spirit in my life working. And I'm trying to tell you, I say that because I know in front of me, people have that. and people. Live, but there might be somebody who, is, who doesn't have that. I'm telling you, the key is this. The word of God, the Bible. Fall in love with God's word. The best thing that ever happened in your life. It helps, it helps you. It gives you wisdom to do anything in life. It gives you happiness. The thoughts of God, hanging, fellowship with God in his word gives you tremendous joy. Joy you can't even describe. And I, I don't think I've described it accurately enough. Because there are no words that I can describe it as. So Nebuchadnezzar has this. Why? Because God did something. He treated him in grace. He learned that God is a God of grace. And God's grace flows from his attribute of love. And we've all been the beneficiaries of God's grace. So what is grace as we close? Just a few definitions. Grace is all that God is free to do and imparting unmerited blessings. That's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar received. Unmerited blessings. Grace is all that God is free to do in imparting unmerited blessings to those who trust in Jesus Christ as Savior based upon the merits of Christ and his death on the cross. Grace is God treating us in a manner that we don't deserve. And it excludes any human works in order to acquire eternal salvation or blessing from God. In fact, you're already blessed. People say, God bless you. And to myself, I go, oh, thank you. I know what they're saying. But it's like, I am blessed. <laughs> I get every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1, 3. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Think about that. I'm in union with Christ. Who's going to inherit the earth? Jesus. Am I his wife? Part of his wife? Yes, I'm, I'm the bride of Christ, along with a lot of other believers. We're going to inherit the earth, a regenerated earth, an earth that's going to, the curse will be lifted. Let, them, let the people who want the world gain the world today, good, it's all going to burn down. It's the devil's world anyways. I want to get the world where Jesus is ruling on the throne, not Satan. God's grace, is, God in his grace is, treats us in a manner that we don't deserve. Grace means that God saved us and he blessed us despite ourselves. That's a blow to human pride. He blessed us, he saved us, not according to anything that we do or did, but rather saved us and blessed us because of the merits of Christ and his work on the cross. It's all because of Jesus. It includes any, it excludes, grace excludes any human merit and salvation and blessing, and it gives the, crea the creator all the credit, credit and the creature none. You know Nebuchadnezzar is come in contact with the grace of God because who's he giving the credit to? God. You can always tell a grace-oriented person is somebody who gives God the glory, praises God, doesn't like, well, seek to praise themselves, seeks to point people in the direction of God, tell them what God has done for them. And lastly, by means of faith, we accept the grace of God which is a non-meritorious system of perception, which is in total accord with the grace of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with what we've heard, instruct us in righteousness, rebuke us, re reprove us if necessary, encourage us. We thank you, Father, for this time to study your word and this lesson that we learned about how you treated Nebuchadnezzar under your grace policy. And we thank you for treating us in grace. And we just thank you so much, Father, for loving us. We don't deserve anything. We thank you for treating us according to your grace policy and giving us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because of our union and identification with your son, Jesus Christ. We also pray that this lesson might bring glory to you and your son, Father. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.